And the specific structures that we looked at were these. Okay, so this one right here, um, I'm going to label these. This one on the far left, this is epinephrine, right? And ones that are similar, your other catecholamines, I went ahead and abbreviated. This is norepinephrine, this is dopamine, okay? We also have this one, this is glutamate. This one here is GABA, which we didn't draw the structure in a previous video, but um, it's important to see the structure. So this is your alpha carbon, your beta carbon, your gamma carbon. So the GABA stands for gamma amino butyrate, okay? Physiological pH, so it's gamma amino butyrate. That's where the name GABA comes from, okay? But the whole point is that what is similar between all of these molecules? And if you need to look up the structure of norepinephrine and dopamine, go ahead and do so. So my question to you is, pause the video and see if you can figure out what's similar between all these molecules. So pause it, see if you can figure it out. And the, the similarity between all these molecules is that they are all polar, okay? They all have many, many... Um, electronegative atoms and to be honest um, the ratio of the ratio of, of electronegative atoms so our electronegative atoms I don't know why that came out white but the ratio of electronegative atoms to carbons is is fairly high right I should probably scroll over uh, the ratio of electronegative atoms to um, carbons is fairly high okay now, it doesn't mean that they have more electronegative atoms. It just means that the ratio is fairly high. So all of these molecules are polar. Now, if you go back to the videos we looked at, and if you go and study all of the biosignaling events, remember that you had your cell membrane, right? So if I draw a big cell, right? So here's a cell. Again, we'll draw an inner membrane. Right? This is our inner segment of the plasma membrane, right? And then remember that we had these receptors, right? So I had to say this was an adrenergic receptor. Remember we had a G protein, right? Here's the alpha subunit, right? And then we had that translocate over to another enzyme, right? And activate that, okay? Now, if you remember, something like epinephrine, did epinephrine ever cross the membrane? Well, no, it didn't. It was confined to the extracellular side of the membrane. Right? It never crossed. And my question to you is why? And pause the video and see if you can figure it out. Why is it that these molecules can't cross the membrane? Um, and that's, of course, not crossing the membrane without a transporter. Okay? Why can these molecules not passively diffuse across the membrane? And I'm assuming at this point that you've already seen membrane physiology, and you've probably seen the structure of phospholipids, right? If you look at the structure of phospholipids, what do they have? They have two um, very hydrophobic alkyl side chains. Do you think that these molecules right here are soluble in um, those uh, phospholipid uh, tails, those hydrophobic carbon chains? Well, no, they're not. So these particular molecules are confined to either the inside of the cell or, in this case, the outside of the cell. And the only way that they can cross them is the transporter. But for the purposes of biosignaling, they have to use these systems, these G protein systems, or in the case of something like insulin, they have to use a tyrosine kinase receptor, right? And insulin also is polar, okay? So basically, you have your first messenger, which is these, right? These up here, these are your first your first messengers, right? And then they activate second messengers, which are on the inside. So your second messengers are here, right? So I hope that makes sense. Okay, so those are your second messengers on the inside of the cell. So if we go back to think about what transduction is, transduction is the process of converting an extracellular signal into an intracellular signal, okay? And again, that has to occur in these molecules through the use of G proteins and things like that, or in the case of insulin, a tyrosine kinase receptor. Of course, the reason I didn't draw insulin is because it's a 50 amino acid peptide. Uh, I don't want to draw that, okay? But know that insulin, the outer surface of it is very polar, okay? So it can't just cross the membrane. It has to use a tyrosine kinase receptor. Likewise, these have to use G protein coupled receptors, or, or if they're using ionotropic receptors, um, they bind to the outside of the cell, okay? So the question is, how do I do something if I'm doing, um, how do I do something if I have a nonpolar molecule, okay? So here's our nucleus, right? And I'm going to come over here and draw several molecules. So I've gone ahead and drawn these molecules. This one right here, this is estradiol. Okay, estradiol is the primary female sex hormone, okay? This one right here, this is, I don't know why I drew an S first, this is testosterone. Okay. 
And this one over here, this is T3, also referred to as triiodothyronine. Um, this is your primary um, thyroid hormone, okay? Now, my question to you is, what is similar between all these molecules? So I challenge you to pause the video and see if you can figure out what's similar. Well, if you think about it, their ratio of electronegative atoms to carbon is very low, okay? So these molecules are very, very hydrophobic. Now, thyro the, the T3, not thyroxin, T3 is probably the least hydrophobic of all of them, but in general, they're all hydrophobic. So if we come back to our cell right here, do you think those molecules are gonna have any problem crossing the membrane? And your answer should be no. They are soluble in the um, alkyl side chains, especially something like, um, like testosterone or estradiol. The steroids, by the way, steroids by definition, which are those things, there are other steroids as well, they are extremely hydrophobic. In fact, they're some of the most hydrophobic molecules you'll ever see in the cell. They are certainly capable of crossing the membrane, okay? And so these will cross the membrane and go directly into the cytosol, okay? So in the blood, okay, if this is our blood out here, okay, you're gonna have some protein carrier, right? some protein carrier, okay. And you're gonna have, let's let's do an example like estradiol. So we'll put an E right here. So estradiol is bound there. And estradiol then moves, it moves through the membrane and it's gonna move into the cytoplasm. Now, eventually the estradiol or whatever hydrophobic molecule we're talking about is going to bind to something called a nuclear receptor, okay. Now, here's one thing I wanna underscore, and this is really just a critical thinking type question because honestly, the answer is not known, okay? What is your cytosol made of? It's made of water. Is your cytosol polar or nonpolar? Well, it's, it's polar, right? So do you think something like estradiol, something like this, is going to be soluble in your cytosol? And the answer should be obviously no, right? It's not soluble, okay? Now, most textbooks will just show estradiol floating from this point, from these membrane just directly into the nucleus. Now, remember that your nucleus, if you look at the picture of a cell, the nucleus is not connected to the, to the membrane, right? And neither is the ER or the Golgi apparatus, all of which are contiguous with the nucleus, right? They're not connected to the membrane. So what books will typically show is that estradiol or whatever you're talking about directly floats from the membrane to the nucleus, right? That cannot be the case. And if you understand polarity, you understand why, okay? Estradiol is not soluble in the cytosol. It can't just float from the membrane to the nucleus, right? There would have to be some protein carrier that picks it up. Now, whether this is the nuclear receptor or not is unknown. And that actually, the reason I say this is because it's a really critical thought type question. And it's an area of research that you could go into. And then probably as my, as my biochem teacher put, it's probably worth a Nobel prize if you figure it out, okay? But ultimately, estradiol has to be picked up by some soluble protein, okay? And then it's gonna be taken into the nucleus, okay? So you first have to stop at this point to be picked up by a, a soluble protein carrier, okay? Now, once you're in the nucleus, okay, so this is your nucleus right here, right? Once you're in the nucleus, you form something called, um, or it might happen in the cytosol, but for the purpose of here, we're gonna say that the protein picks it up um, in, the, in the cytosol, and then it carries it to the nucleus, and by the time you're in the nucleus, you have something called a hormone, hormone nuclear, receptor, hormone nuclear receptor complex. And the reason they call it that is because the, the hormone, which was estradiol, right? Again, we're gonna put E for estradiol, is complexed with a protein called a nuclear receptor. Okay, so it's complex with a nuclear receptor, okay? And this complex is going to bind to DNA. So I'll have my DNA strand here. Let me do it in orange. So this part of the DNA, this is just some part of the DNA, right? And then there's a part that I'm concerned with, and this part, okay, right here, this is called my hormone response element. And then, of course, I have the rest of my DNA, okay? The blue part is called a hormone response element, typically abbreviated HRE, and the hormone response element is what's going to bind the hormone nuclear receptor complex, okay? Now, what does this do? Well, the hormone nuclear receptor complex, my phone's ringing, let me pause this real quick. Welcome back. Um, sorry, I had to I had to cut it off there. If you heard the phone ring, my mother just called me. She asked me to watch our dog. We just got a puppy, anyways. Um, 
So I have to go over to there anyways. Um, but the point is that um, we have this, this the estradiol, which is bound to the hormone nuclear receptor. It's going to bind to something called hormone response elements, okay? And effectively what the hormone nuclear receptor complex does is it acts as a transcription factor, okay? What is a transcription factor? Well, transcription factors generally control the rate of transcription, okay? So somewhere in the nucleus, I'm going to have my RNA polymerase, okay? RNA polymerase catalyzes the synthesis of mRNA, um, well, considering it's RNA polymerase 2, it's mRNA, okay, of transcription of the DNA, okay? Now, what might not be apparent to you now, unless you've taken something like microbiology, is that we have things called activators and repressors, okay? Repressors bind to components of the DNA, um, and what repressors do is they make it less favorable for RNA polymerase to bind. Therefore, if RNA polymerase can't bind as well, they decrease the rate of transcription, right? Or I can have enhancers or activators, depending on what you want to call them, um, and what they do, what the activators do, is they make it more favorable for RNA polymerase to bind. Therefore, they increase the rate of transcription. So ultimately, what, depending on which hormone you have, okay, they will influence either the, the um, you can have either the binding of activators or you can have the binding of repressors. And depending on what you bind, that can influence the rate of transcription, okay? So in other words, if you want to increase the rate of mRNA synthesis, you would have to bind an activator. If you wanted to decrease it, you have to have a repressor. So ultimately, if we have net activation, that's gonna make it more favorable for RNA polymerase to bind, okay? Assuming that's RNA polymerase. And then what you're gonna do is you're going to get you're going to get an mRNA strand that comes off. The mRNA strand is going to be is going to come off. It's going to leave the nucleus, right? And it's going to meet up with a ribosome, okay? A ribosome. Um, de it depends on where the protein is going to go. If it's going for um, if it's going for the membrane, it's going to be a or for exocytosis, the the ribosome is going to be part of the ER. If it's just going to be a, a regular protein of the cytosol or the nucleus, it's going to be um, a free ribosome in the cytosol, okay? But the point is that you get a ribosome that translates the mRNA, mRNA excuse me, into a protein, okay? So that's general your, stru your structure of your, of your, of your um, biosignaling for things that can cross the membrane. And just remember, these molecules are sufficiently hydrophobic enough to cross the membrane, but they're not sufficiently uh, hydrophilic enough to be transported in the cytosol free. So there's going to have to be some mechanism to get them into the nucleus. They're not just going to float free. So don't think that just because your book shows that, it doesn't mean it's correct. Okay? There has to be some mechanism to get the, the molecule from the membrane into the nucleus. And honestly, that's an area of ongoing research. And if you figured that out, it's probably a Nobel Prize. It's worth a Nobel Prize, honestly, that you win. Okay? But the whole, let's do a quick recap. So polar molecules have to have these complex biosignaling pathways where they bind to something on the membrane, like a receptor. And then it induces a second messenger system, and we get all that business. Okay? But hydrophobic molecules like steroids and, and thyroid hormones, right, those are hydrophobic enough to where they can cross the membrane. And they're going to be transported through the blood on this protein carrier, right? They're going to hit the membrane, and something like estradiol is going to move through the membrane and be picked up by a soluble protein carrier in the cytosol that's going to carry it to the nucleus, right? And ultimately, you're going to have, by the time you get to the nucleus, it's, you're going to have the hormone recept nuclear receptor complex which is going to bind to hormone response elements in the DNA, which is basically the area of interest that you want for a steroid, and it's going to influence the rate of transcription by binding either activators or repressors, okay? And the activators and repressors are also transcription factors as well, okay? So I hope this video gave you a little bit, little bit of intuitive sense on nuclear receptors, okay? Remember, nuclear receptors are for things that can cross the membrane but are not hydrophilic enough to where they can go through the cytosol. So generally you're talking about steroids, um, thyroxin, or T3, your thyroid hormones. Also retinoic acid is something that does this as well. But the major players that we usually talk about are going to be either thyroid hormone or generally are steroids. Okay. So other things like cortisol, cortisol, aldosterone, um, progesterone, um, those are some of the main ones that we're talking about with respect to steroids. They are steroids and they're going to be able to cross the membrane and meet up with nuclear receptors. Okay, so see you in the next video.
Welcome back to the biosignaling playlist. Um, what I hope to do in this video is make this one short and to the point. Okay, this is an incredibly important. Um, this is an incredibly important video. Okay, so if up to this point um, we looked at specific uh, molecules, 